There's no doubt now that JRPGs are my favourite genre of games, but I never grew up with the likes of Chrono Trigger or Breath of Fire or Suikoden 2. I actually got into JRPGs in my mid-teens during the Xbox 360 era. At the time I was playing the so-called popular games like Modern Warfare 2 and I realised quite quickly that they were not for me, so I started looking for single player experiences with an emphasis on story. And after perusing GameSpot, yes, I used GameSpot for my game recommendations back then, I finally found my first purchase. And the first JRPG I bought was this one, Eternal Sonata. Developed by Tri-Crescendo, Eternal Sonata was the perfect start for me in the world of JRPGs. Even now, I consider it to be one of the most charming games I have ever played. Eternal Sonata itself explores the bridge between reality and fantasy. Most of it takes place in the subconscious dream world of Frédéric Chopin, a Polish pianist who died in 1849, and it's him basically living out his final moments within this world. And it's clear that the inspiration for this world is drawn directly from him. If I had to imagine a land created by a pianist, this is a pretty good visualisation of it. Colourful, vibrant, character names inspired by music itself like Allegretto, Jazz, Viola, and even chapters that are representations of Chopin's more well-known pieces. Oh yeah, and the OST is amazing as well. But it really gets the player to question the realities of a dream world. What happens upon the creator's awakening, or will the world cease to exist if the source of the dream passes on? And that, in of itself, is represented excellently by the main protagonist in Polka, who is a rebirth of Chopin's youngest sister who died at the age of 14 in 1827, the same age as Polka herself. It's kind of the method by which Chopin keeps his youngest sister alive, at least in his subconscious mind, and she herself becomes the centre of those key plot developments. I just loved everything about it. I probably am looking at Eternal Sonata through rose-tinted goggles because it was my first proper JRPG experience, but I have no doubt it's a game I could pick up again years later and still enjoy massively. After that I quickly found my second game, which at that time had just released, and again through GameSpot as a recommendation. Unfortunately, it was also the game that I had the least amount of fun on, and it was... Final Fantasy XIII. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I really struggled with Final Fantasy XIII when I first played it. I got to around the 20 hour mark where you go to Hope's home and fight a gunship I believe, and after wiping I just put the game down. It was only about two years ago that I resolved to try it one more time, and I did see it through to completion on that occasion, but the deficiencies still stood out. Most notably, I don't care how many people try to convince me that it's deep tactically because I couldn't stand the combat in this game. I'm only going off my own experiences here, but the tactic was pretty much always the same. Buff yourself up, debuff the enemy, switch between Commander and Ravager paradigms and profit. And that thought is never going to change. I gave it two tries for an added perspective, it was exactly the same as I felt the first time around. It's a good thing then that I personally don't place too much weight on gameplay, I place heavier importance on the narrative. And Final Fantasy XIII has a decent story, if not a little convoluted at times, but my main issue with it was that the pacing was jarring because you're consistently switching between the different pairs after they split off from each other. It's only like 25 hours in that they all come together. By no means the worst game I've played, but it just wasn't for me. Luckily though, that didn't sway me from JRPGs as a genre, and I went to my local game store and found a game on sale. And I think this is the one and only time that I have been sold on box art alone. And that game was Star Ocean The Last Hope. This game, man, it drew on my inner child. That desire to explore the cosmos, discovering new planets, and having your own ship to go where you want, or at least have the illusion of it. Star Ocean had it all. It remains one of the only JRPGs that I have played through twice, which even to this day is very rare for me. I normally reserve that for Falcon games only. But it was just a really enjoyable adventure for me. First of all, the aforementioned exploration aspect. The game is based around humanity basically screwing itself over with World War 3 and now they need to find a new world to move to as Earth itself is rapidly deteriorating. As part of a group called the Space Reconnaissance Force or SRF, our story takes us on a journey of interstellar travel which sees the player visit worlds of vicious fauna and otherworldly phenomena. That's cool man. That's already a big plus in my book, so much so that I even see past the main character's name of Edge Maverick. 
But then on top of that, you've got an intuitive real-time combat system, free movement to go wherever you want in the arena, but a system that rewards reflexes with the blindside system, which was very satisfying. On top of that, you have a colourful cast of characters who are mostly enjoyable, except for Limmel, and a private action system where you get to see some funny side events during your downtime. Yeah, I remember having a great time with Star Ocean The Last Hope. It may not have had the deepest narrative or the most complex characters, at least from my memory, but it did what I wanted from a space epic. And after that fourth adventure, I had an idea of the kind of game that I was looking for, and thus it didn't take me too long to find that fourth JRPG to play. And it is a game that I consider to be timeless. It is... Lost Odyssey, developed by Mistwalker. Lost Odyssey was an excellent experience through and through, a real epic and grand narrative spanning multiple kingdoms and based around a very compelling and deep theme, which, to be honest, is no surprise considering it came from the likes of Hironobu Sakaguchi. The story is mostly focused around the likes of Kaim, who is our main protagonist and part of a group of immortals who also has lost his memories. And with that curse, so to speak, you get to see the consequences of what it means to be immortal as he slowly regains those memories. There's a bunch of heartfelt scenes in this journey, real emotion that underlies this war between kingdoms in the midst of a magic industrial revolution. And what that results in is some of the best character development I have ever seen in the game. Jansen, for example, or Jansen if we're going Icelandic, in the course of that first disc, and yes, there are four discs for Lost Odyssey, was possibly the most annoying character I had seen up to that point, but he actually became one of my favourites by the end. He still maintained that idiocy which underpinned his persona, but they somehow managed to make it endearing. And that's the thing. Despite its scale, Lost Odyssey felt like a character-driven narrative done right. The pacing and the moments given to each individual were just enough to not take away from the story, while also allowing us to grow to care for the main cast. Add on to that a homage to the turn-based systems of old with just a little bit of real-time input added with the aim ring system, an excellent OST, and an emphasis on battle formation, and you have what is, in my mind even now, one of the most underrated JRPGs of all time. And finally, we end with a game that started my journey, or my Falcon journey more specifically, and it was... East Origin. My first Falcon game came to me on a whim. My first year of university was over, I had some spare cash before I went home, so I looked on Steam for something to purchase. It didn't take me long to find a title that caught my eye. It was East Origin and I was caught hook, line and sinker by that trailer. The music alone was enough to draw me in. And then I play the game. Graphics may not be top tier, but they have an odd charm to them. The controls are tight and inputs are responsive, just as I would want from an action RPG. Sprite art is expressive, the story, while simple, takes on multiple viewpoints and is delivered well, and of course, it's hard as hell. Rewardingly challenging, it pumps that adrenaline, especially during those boss battles. This was the perfect introduction to the E series, and it was the game that arguably was the source for this channel even starting. Origin may not look like anything special, but the E series in general is just something that you need to experience in order to fully appreciate it. Every game has a certain element of magic that just isn't replicated anywhere else, an identity that sets it apart from the crowd. Once you're hooked in, you can't really escape, and Falcom are experts at that particular facet. They've done it with the Trail series as well. All it takes is one game, and East Origin was that one game for me. I have nothing bad to say about it, and I've said many times that I owe East Origin a massive debt for introducing me to Neon Falcom. So much so that I even celebrated that with dedicating one of my first figure purchases to this game. And there it is guys, the first five JRPGs that I ever played, and though I've played many more since, I think it's important not to forget your roots. It's cool to reminisce about this kind of stuff when life was supposedly more simple, and I think that's just important in general, never to forget your humble beginnings.